Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. And I bet you're exposed to investment risk right now. To reduce it, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and download the risk reduction checklist that I've made specifically for you, my podcast listeners, based on the lessons I've learned from all my guests. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy. And I'm here with featured guest, Kunal Chandiramani. Kunal, can you take a minute and tell us whether you are ready to rock? <laughs> I am ready to rock. I know, you know, I can feel your energy from the moment that we started talking. So I'm excited for today's conversation. I'm gonna introduce you to the audience. So uh, Kunal founded KSTAR Inc. in 2016 and continues as the CEO. And they are making the internet a reachable market for anyone. He's an international best-selling author of the book, Know It Works Before It Works, How to Find Your Good Idea. And he's a three-time TEDx presenter, and many, many more things. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to meet Kunal. Kunal, can you take a moment and fill any further tidbits about your life? Um, my life is fun. I'm all about having fun. That's, that is, I really, I do everything. That's what entrepreneurship is for me, having fun and doing stuff that changes the world and have fun in the background. That's the most important part. <laughs> do you ever come across anybody that's like annoyed that you have fun? Like business is supposed to be serious. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it. I think being yeah, being a younger person, a lot of people. I think there's this certain point in life when you get when everyone thinks that the youngest guy on the table would know the least, and everyone's trying to educate him, or educate him about every single thing. And yeah, I think I think so way too often. But I think I, I, every time I do that, I, I like seeing how old Richard Branson is, and he still has fun. So that answers it for me. Mm. <laughs> And maybe just for a moment, you could fill in a little bit about kind of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and, you know, what, what excites you about your work. I think the core of, of entrepreneurship is doing something that, uh, that primarily, I think we really end up confusing entrepreneurship uh, as something that gives us, a, gives us. Entrepreneurship is, give, is about giving to the society. It is about doing something for the society. It's not about doing something for yourself. If you want to do something for yourself, there, there are way easier ways to do that. This is, you should just go to a parlor or go for a spa. That's a way for you to do something for yourself. Entrepreneurship is about doing something for the world. And when you can do something for the world, something that's going to change people's lives, that's something that's going to impact the world to be a better place. Anything that's going to make the world something that you imagined, anything that is for the world, that's too much fun to not have. So yeah, mm. I think I was talking to a friend a few days back and what I've come to believe is certain entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs because that's the only thing they can do. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's know, crazy fun. It definitely is. <laughs> and you know, one of the things after interviewing so many uh, entrepreneurs and startup people that are involved in startups, one of the big mistakes that they make is that they they don't get out to market fast enough. You know, they really should have gotten out to market a lot earlier to, to, to go through their product and stuff. But in some cases, you could say that in, they were maybe scared of the world or scared of the market or scared to bring it out to the market. And what you're talking about is the idea of like really engaging the world, bringing something out, you know. And, and I just wonder if you have some advice for people that are like a little bit afraid to bring their product or themselves out to the market. Uh, I think it's easy to realize that, like, there was this fantastic quote I read. I'm not sure who it is by, but whoever it is can have the credit. It is, it was the idea that if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, uh, you launched way too late. Reed Hoffman. And, okay, <laughs> credits to Reed Hoffman. <laughs> but I think that's, that's, it's really important to, uh, to not wait for everything because you need to see that it's, uh, First thing is I do not encourage competing. I encourage collaborating. That's the first thing. But even, even though I encourage it in 
a very, very bullish manner, it's still important to keep in mind that we live in a world of 8 billion people. And the idea that you have a unique thought and the idea that what you're doing is very unique is a minuscule. There's a high probability that someone at the same time is doing something. So who do you want to be? The guy who waits uh, months to launch it while the other guys are already in the market and has, has raised enough capital to build it up to the next? Or you want to be the guy who's looking at that guy and saying, oh, oh, shit, I should have launched. Because there's a high probability you're not the uni- unique person you think you are. Mm. And yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going against a lot of the things that our society is built on uniqueness and entitlement but as entitled as we are supposed to be for our own uniqueness i think it's important to realize that we live in a world of eight billion people okay that's great and um, it reminds me when i first started teaching when i moved to thailand i was teaching finance at university and i'd never worked in finance i'd only studied it so (laughs) i knew nothing and i was like you know preparing in the textbook and all that and i was so kind of panicked that I came up with a way of handling that by saying to myself, I'm not going to be the best teacher (laughs) in the world, you know, whatever, but I'm also not going to be the worst. And it allowed me just to kind of get out there and just start being who I was. And I guess part of what you're saying is that don't get too hung up on the idea that, you know, you're the only one and, and, you know, that type of thing, just get out with the product and start bringing it out to those 8 billion people and you'll find a small group of people that will love it. Uh, So ideally, I'm also talking about that if you think you're the only one building the next breakthrough product, there's a good chance that out of those 8 billion people, there's someone else who is also building this exact same thing. But what it's about is it's sometimes, see, you do not know one who is the best starts off as the best. And you need to realize that if if Mark Zuckerberg today runs a uh, multi-billion dollar company, he did not start off running a multi-billion dollar company. And you need to see how this stuff works. It's not, mm. if someone's number one, they, they became number one because they, were, because they went up the list. So I think it's important to think that you can be the best, but it's not, it, you shouldn't force yourself that I need to be the best. You should always keep in mind that I should try to be the best. And like what Jeff Bezos said, so Jeff Bezos has this fantastic story where he wanted to be an engineer an electrical engineer. And he decided not to, given the fact that he realized that he can never be the best electrical engineer. Mm. But he realized that he can, he might be able to be the best computer engineer, or he might be able to be the best entrepreneur. He might be able to find the right mixture for himself. And that is what, if you, you should always get into industry where you can be the best. If you think you cannot be the best electrical engineer, do not be an electrical engineer. But if you think you can be the best, one percent of computer engineers or you can be the world's top 10 computer engineers go and be a computer engineer it Mm. depends on how big the market is if the market everyone is in the one percent then the one percent is nothing then Mm. you want to be in the top 10 but any industry that you think you cannot be in the top 10 of is not an industry for you you should get into an industry where you can be the top 10 now keep that in mind you can you should get into industry that you can be in the top 10 Now, once you do have that in mind, the second thing you want to keep in mind is that you aren't going to start off being the top 10. (laughs) You're going to start off at the bottom. So, But keep it in mind. Keep it in mind. Do not forget. Keep it in mind. But now you start from the bottom and get get up. It's sometimes just about going out there, jumping off the cliff and making a plane while falling. Got it. All right. Well, a lot of good lessons there. And now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one ever goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and then tell us your story. Hmm. So my worst investment, I, I love that. I, I think we need to talk so much more about our worst investments as much as we talk about our best investments. Uh, so my worst investment was most definitely paying for media, paying for a press release. That was I did it once and I did it just once and that was by far okay. I think I lost you. I can't hear okay. you. Okay. Yep. So we just got back. So let's go back to that and say 
you were just. Uh, what do you lose? You, yeah. Should so I start I just, from the start? Yeah, yeah. Just start from the stop. Start, and we'll cut that part out. But just say that my, you know, worst investment ever was paying for media, and then go into it. Okay, I'll start from the right there. Yep. Uh, my worst investment ever. It is definitely, definitely paying for media. It's once that I did that, and just once. And yeah, I think I paid for a press release, and the ROI was horrible. I think, I think when we get into it, we really glorify it. So the circumstances was we were launching a new venture. I want, and, and when we start off as an entrepreneur, we have this idea that I'm going to be on the cover page of the Forbes magazine. Yeah, I'm going to be on the cover page here. I'm going to be on the, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be there. But the thing you need to realize is, yes, you can be on the cover page of the Forbes magazine, but you're not going to pay to get on the cover page of the Forbes magazine. And you need to realize that, and that's one thing you need to realize. And second thing you need to realize is a lot of the best companies in the world aren't on the cover page of the Forbes magazine. And you need to realize that you need to realize what are you in it for? And it's important. A lot of the best businesses aren't. Uh, so that was the worst investment I ever made. I paid, so we were launching a new venture and I was under the impression that all the best ventures in the world have a lot of media coverage. But any business before a hundred million dollars that is getting a lot of media coverage is getting a lot of media coverage, not because they are. <laughs> so it's important to realize. So any until once you cross a hundred million or you're a public company, it's different. But mm. but if you're not a hundred million dollar company or if you're not a billion dollar company or a ten billion dollar company, and you're paying for media, it's not worth it. It's the worst this is worst investment I've ever made. <laughs> I just expected a lot more out of it. I really did expect a lot more. I was under the weird impression that it, that all the best businesses in the world get a lot of media coverage and getting a lot of media coverage will get me a lot of customers. Mm. So yeah, that, that's an interesting point, that last point. So if you could summarize, I know that there's some listeners out there that are just about to sign a check, transfer some money, to get their media coverage and tell them what lessons did you learn from this experience? First thing is good media is dead. There is a lot of good media. There's a lot of media that's like Forbes magazine. I love it. Yep. I, I read the Forbes magazine regularly. It's good media. I, I know very few people who have paid their way into a Forbes magazine because it's freaking expensive. You need to be really, really rich to do that. But a lot of the other magazines that are ranked in the same level aren't. So first thing you need to realize is the good difference between good media and bad media. Good media is media you don't pay for. Media is good when you don't pay for it. Media is not good when you pay for it. When you don't pay for media, it'll get you a much better ROI, even if you pay. So if you're going to pay $10, which is a, which you're not going to get anything for, mm. but I'm just thinking, just hypothetically, if you paid a dollar, a dollar for media and, you, and the ROI was X and you did not pay that dollar, your ROI would be 2X even without paying that dollar because good media wouldn't charge you. It is the bad side of media, the low ROI side of media that sells cheap mm. uh, or that just sells, even if it doesn't sell cheap, because I know for sure that we didn't get, we did not get it for very cheap. So it's important to realize that press releases when they're done organically are good when mm -hmm. not they aren't. So it's just realizing that it's okay. A lot of the best businesses do not get media and getting media is not going to change the world. And it is, and sometimes when you're building a good business, that money does better in a lot of other places than in media. Media's paying for media is never a good idea. Paying for a press release is not a good idea. Got it. A couple okay. of things, keep it in mind. <laughs> yep. So um, let me summarize a few things. I, I guess uh, one of the things is the idea of attraction rather than promotion. And, you know, the job of a great person, a great business person, and that is to attract the media and get them to come to you and you know it may seem a little bit odd of a thing to do because it's not that easy to do but on the other hand on the other hand think about how we met right i reached out to you in a way that attracted you to come to me right and that's the point is that we want to reach out to the world about our products, our service, what we're doing in a, in a way. It doesn't have, it just in a unique way that gets people coming to you. So, so my first takeaway is the concept of attraction rather than promotion. And the second thing that I take away 
and and I I had the same exact problem myself, except I didn't learn it as well as you learn it because I tried it a few times and I used to when I worked at big banks, I was in the media a lot because they wanted to quote someone from Citibank or something like that. But when I went on my own, I thought, well, I got to really get out there and push the media. But one of the other lessons that I learned, and you mentioned it right at the end, is that just getting media doesn't mean you get any sales. <laughs> and that's really a second takeaway is that, you know, what we need when we're doing business really ultimately is we need our customers. We need revenue. We need to find those people that, you know, and, and, and if just getting on a TV show and showing your face and showing your friends and your mom and your whoever, look, I'm on TV. If it doesn't bring sales, you may want to be doing something else. So those are two things I, that I'm thinking about. I think it's important to build a business that the media wants to cover, not being the business that wants the media to cover it. It's, it's a big difference in the two. And it's funny how we very often want to be in the first, but we push ourselves into the second. Being a business that the media wants to cover is doing stuff that changes the world. Like I left Clubhouse. Clubhouse is not paying for media. It's, it's a year old company. And I think every media house in the world would pay to get an interview with, with any of the founders. I, I, I know. I, I, and, and that is the beauty of the platform of building a business that the world wants to cover. Do not be the business that's going after the world to cover it. I think it's finding the right right way to tackle and, and, and the right time. You should sometimes, I think we have this new age, uh, I don't know if I should call it bullshit, uh, because I know a lot of close friends believe in it. And I don't, I don't mean any harm, but I just do not believe in it. Building in the public. Mm. There's this new idea that go on Twitter that I'm going to build in the public. Every single thing I do, I'm going to post it here. I don't think that's a good idea. I, I, I think sometimes it's important to have, I think more than not, it's important to not build in the public <laughs> because a lot of the best businesses aren't built on the stage. They are built on the backstage. Uh, like I, I love B2B businesses a lot more than B2C businesses because very often they are a lot more profitable in the short term and the long term. Like 1% of B2B, B2C businesses reach where 90% uh, where of B2B businesses reach because they build on the backstage where people, where people aren't, uh, where people are a lot more forward-looking compared to on the front stage where people are criticizing for every small mistake. So I don't believe in building in the public. I believe in building products that are available to the public, but building in secret, building stuff that changes the world and getting media is, getting media doesn't really mean anything. Mm, interesting. And one of my businesses in Thailand is a coffee roasting factory and it's a B2B business. And for 25 years, we've been supplying coffee shops, hotels, restaurants, offices. And we always are asked, why don't you have a coffee shop? Why don't you have a coffee shop? <laughs> and we say, well, first of all, we supply and support 1,000 coffee shops or whatever in Thailand. <laughs> so we don't want to compete with them. But really, truthfully, we like B2B. It's what, where we can grow. We can execute. We have good margins. And we can support our customers, but our customers are on the front lines and it can be pretty tough out there. Uh, and so I love B2B too. So great, great insight. The ROI is amazing. I love the ROI. Like yeah. you look at the B2C ROI, you serve a, you serve a thousand. So, I, I, so some B2C businesses like Facebook is a B2, wait, no, Facebook is a B2B business. It's not a B2C business. Mm. <laughs> but say a lot of, in fact, I think now I just ended up in a very deep spot. I was about to say that Facebook and Instagram a successful B2C businesses, but now that I think of it, they're B2B businesses. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's, the, the, cut, the, the individual is just a, uh, a commodity that they're using. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that makes me, I think it's important to realize a lot of the most successful B2C businesses are B2B, Amazon. Mm -hmm. Amazon, you might think yeah, Amazon is a B2C business, but Amazon, one of Amazon's biggest successes is a product called AWS, which is B2B. And I think it's important to realize that, uh, that only 1% of B2C businesses reach where 100%, when 90% of B2B businesses reach. But even in that 1%, most of the, out of that 1%, 50% are also B2B businesses. So, and, and most of them reached, so it's, it's a very good insight. Like say, even if you look at a Google, Google's main revenue stream is G Suite. Mm. Yep. Apart from advertisements, I think Google has a very solid B2C, but, but it's, their B2C is not their only business. Their B2B is fantastic. G Suite yeah. is amazing. Yep. 
So ladies and gentlemen, go for B2B. All right, based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, what one action would you recommend our listeners take? Think about our listeners who are just about to do some PR and paying for media. What one action would you recommend that they take to avoid suffering the same fate? <laughs> I, I love talking about mistakes because I think we need to talk about them more. Like Warren Buffett credits his entire success to single digit investment decisions, not even to, less than 10 decisions made of Warren Buffett. So I think it's important to realize that not all your decisions are going to change the world. And it's okay to make a few mistakes, but this is not a mistake you want to make because I have not met too many people who have been happy. I paid for media. I, I met no one like that. So yeah, it's, yes. it's important to realize where you stand and that do not make yourself feel better by saying, okay, I am on the cover page of this magazine. Don't, if you're doing that to make yourself feel better, no, you shouldn't do that. Mm. It's just not worth it. You can make yourself feel better by having a good cup of coffee. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. I have a lot of those. Well, last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Ah, now that's tricky. I think... I think I, I set three I set 36 month goals and I set three month goals. I did not set 12 month goals because it's overrated. I mm. think we we un, we overemphasize it. We over, and so I set three month goals and I set set 36 month goals. But because I think it's we 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 have a very bad ability to predict 12 months and realize. I think our we planned a very, very good business uh, proposition in December 2019. Uh, that we're going to change the world by December 2020. I think the world changed Change. itself. We yeah, did not exactly. have to do anything. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I prefer planning for three months. I prefer planning for a quarter. But even if I have to put out 12 months, I think it is basically uh, going first, keeping up with a culture. A good culture is the most important thing. We love our culture. Mm. And second is starting something. I think I'm a, I look at myself as a serial entrepreneur. So I don't know what I'm going to be doing 12 months later. I do. I'm, I might be doing something totally different today, and and it might be the biggest success or the biggest mistake. And if it is the biggest mistake, I'm going to be back here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but if not, I, I'm going to be working on something totally different in 12 months, or I might not. So I think it's. I think I'm going to leave myself that margin, but I know I'm going to be doing something that's going to be impacting a lot of people, and I'm not going to be paying for media because it is not worth it. It is Perfect. never worth it. And it's not going to get you anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. My number one goal for the next 12 months, or maybe three months, or 36 months, is to help you, my listeners, reduce risk in your life. So go to myworstinvestmentever.com right now, download the risk reduction checklist, and see how you measure up. Now, as we conclude, Pranal, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of Ace Dots Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Uh, just don't get too serious. I think, I think business has this weird attitude that, hey, you need to be serious, you're in business. Just have fun. That is it. And just be yourself. You don't need to act like Richard Branson when you can be, be someone you're, who, you, who you're looking every day in the mirror. Have fun and be yourself. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. This is your worst podcast host saying, I'll see you on the upside.